Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very, very special edition of Holly Randall Unfiltered. Not only is it Christmas time, as you can see with this gorgeous Christmas tree right next to us, uh, we have <laughs> some very special Christmas treats for you today. Um, one of them is Alan Amoto. Amoto? Fuck <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> I had been pronouncing his mispronouncing his name for like a few years since mm. we've known each other, and he corrected me at the Kickstarter launch party. And now I'm, I am afraid to um, call just him awful Alan to say to Domo say it again. Arigato, Mister Amato. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Alan Amato. Is that not what I said? A moto. Oh, fuck me. You keep turning me into a, some kind of epic <laughs> futuristic motorcycle, which I'm not mad about. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, Alan is a photographer extraordinaire. If you haven't seen his work, go check it out. He's super, super talented. We actually did like a little um, video together for our Patreons. And part of this Kickstarter event that we are here to talk about, um, we will be doing a joint workshop together as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, of course, I would be remiss to not introduce my mother. The one and only oh, Suze Randall, <laughs> um, who is the whole reason, well, that I am here today, literally yeah. <laughs> living on this planet, but also why we are all sitting here today doing this live show for you guys. So um, we are releasing her, re-releasing her 1977 memoir named Suze. Um, it was written by my father, who passed away in January, and one of his... I don't want to say dying wishes because that sounds very dramatic, but he definitely, we were working on this memoir together um, when he passed and he did say to me, um, you know, please make sure that this gets out. Please make sure that this gets published. And um, so that's what we're doing here today. Daddy, I am fulfilling my promise. <laughs> um, and of course, we are doing this with the help of Alan, who is a Kickstarter expert extraordinaire so i'm going to let him tell you guys a little bit about this campaign what we are offering and where you can go to get this special book thank you well uh, a little bit of backstory uh, this was um originally supposed to be a holly randall book but uh tragically when holly and i uh had a meeting for the book. She mentioned the memoir and mentioned the whole kind of situation around it and also kind of dropped that Suze didn't really have a serious art book with her work. And um, I kind of uh, abruptly took it upon myself to like insert myself into the Randall empire and be like, well, no, we got to do a Suze book first and then we'll do a Holly book and then we'll do another Suze book and it'll just and, and on and on and on. But so we were originally very excited to do your photography book, which is definitely going to happen. But then it kind of morphed into this sort of re-release of the memoir and an art book and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And fundamentally for me, I've, I've run, this is my 10th Kickstarter project. And the other nine have always been for the detritus that falls out of my head. Um, but I've always wanted to try and bring, you know, the... Uh, what little expertise I have just based on doing so many projects to try and bring uh, the vision of another artist to life. And filth to the, the top. Exactly. Visionary filth to life. <laughs> um, That's actually a great title. It is. I think we Bringing got the title visionary for Visionary filth to life. Yeah. We got the title of the, of the book. Maybe we had to change it. Visionary filth. Actually, we, yeah, someone write that down. Um, and, and the cool thing about this was I've... Um, what needed to happen for me, I didn't know it at the time yet, was I needed to, I, it needed to be a book that I wanted to see on my table. And I think, and Suze was just kind of perfect for that. I've been a fan of you uh, for in one way or another since I was like in my 20s. I still remember seeing both of you guys' work and it was always, uh, obvi obviously I shoot a lot of naked pe people too. I don't really differentiate between nude and clothed or any of that shit. But when you looked at pictorials from both of you it was just it just looked better than anything else that was out there there was the whether you think of sex and fucking and all that stuff as trashy or not the images were just gorgeous like there was just nothing trashy about them you're such a perv I know that's true too um so yeah I think I 
I just remember thinking I I want to see this book on my coffee table. So obviously, like <laughs> I'm gonna make the fucking book, and that way I can make sure that it's on there. Um, huh. Yeah, and so that's an, I guess that's more than enough backstory. But the Kickstarter itself, I think we have we have the memoir that's been kind of it's a it's a new edition. There's new. Uh, new verbiage, but especially there's 18 pages of images that have never been like not seen before. So that'll I think that'll really kind of tell uh, tell more of a story uh, as well. New like new cover, cool design, all that stuff. But real then, names in there. actual real names. <laughs> um, and then we have the limited edition art book that's selling really really fantastically in a gorgeous slipcase, and we have a variant cover for that. And that's basically. I want to say that spans Suze's whole career, but I get the feeling maybe that's this is going to be like one of many. Yeah. Because I know there's there's certain things that we can't use yet, so obviously we have to do at least one more, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And in addition to that, we also have prints of some of the incredible shots. Um, and my kind of favorite new reward is a we're doing a, a super super limited clamshell release, and it's very very uh, subject specific. So we started with Dita Von Teis, uh, and moved on to Sasha Gray, and the next one we're going to do is Ginger Lynn, and it's a clamshell box that has all the books, ten print, ten signed prints inside, and it's it's there's re they're really they're limited to like two or three depending on who this who the model is, so they're super super limited, um, and I think they're just going to be an amazing kind of. 2001 Space Odyssey artifact where at some point we're all going to be dead and they're going to be monkeys uh, <laughs> still, circling still around a Sue's book hitting it with bones. Monkeys still reading Sue's book. Yeah. I'll so still be alive. When you say <laughs> ain't that the truth um, <laughs> when you say all the books does that mean that the memoir is going to be in it as yes, well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it'll be a memoir it'll be the limited edition uh, photography book the prints and it'll be in this really cool clamshell clamshell box awesome. and I have this is a fever dream and I'm talking to uh, the printer about it, but what I would love to do is find some way to have, because it's uh, subject specific, when you get the Ginger Lynn clamshell, the cover will actually also be a Ginger Lynn image. That might be a little bit too pricey to produce, but if not, it's going to be an amazing image of Sue's. So either yeah. way, you win. Either way, you win. I mean, that definitely sounds like a yeah. collector's edition. Um, just for everyone to see, I just want to. This is the original Sue's book, um, printed in 1977. This is actually like literally the only copy of this version that we have. Um, I've seen this go for as much as like $3,000 on Amazon, which is crazy. Um, after this Kickstarter is over, I will actually be raffling this, like talk about limited edition, this original book off um, on our website called Raffle. Um, I'll Put out more information about that of course will be signed by Suze but um I just kind of wanted to show everybody the OG book because here it is it's right here I'll just sit on it yeah I'm not gonna let you touch this thing with like your sticky jam hands or anything <laughs> like that I keep this far away from my mother and her her um paper eating puppy um but speaking of OG uh Suze Randall of course um you mentioned when Alan was talking about um, this like reprint about real names, what do you mean by that? All the people I fucked at the mansion. <laughs> okay, well there you go. So um, Humphrey remembered their names. I can't remember them. <laughs> I remember their pe penises, but uh, that's I feel like it. you don't even really remember their penises either. I feel like that's a lie. Well, who could forget Jim Brown? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Jim Brown is a, apparently a memorable penis. But um, <laughs> among him, there were some other uh, celebrities that you had dalliances with at the Playboy Mansion. And I guess previously they used, um, you know, fake names to protect their identities. I don't know why. And uh, now we've come out with some real names. Do you want to do a little bit of name dropping? What no. names are in there? No, no. No? The, you have to buy the book to find out? Yeah, because I can't remember all of them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a really good thing that my father wrote this book because she, like, apparently doesn't remember anything that happened in it, even though it's all true. Um, okay, well, let's circle back to your origin story for anybody who doesn't know it. And if you guys haven't seen um, the very first episode of this podcast, it's kind of crazy, actually, now that we're doing this, because my very first episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered was with my mom and dad. 
Um, and so that's episode number one. So if you haven't seen it, you should definitely go back and watch that. <laughs> but if you haven't seen that and you want to know my mom's origin story, um, mom, why don't you let us know how did how did this all come to be? Oh, it was your father's fault. Um, I was a nurse, a midwife in London, St. George's Hospital, and I, I was, well, I was a naughty girl, but I wasn't sexually naughty. I was like half a virgin. Um, and then I met, it was my birth, 22nd birthday, I met Humphrey, and I fell in love the moment I saw him. And he says the same, too. It's actually, like, really yeah, I know. lovely it, to hear the story. And I had a top on that showed my lovely thin waist then and I got sort of a bit embarrassed I went and changed into a reasonable shirt and then he gave me a couple of drinks and I went back and put the top on again and he knew I was his and um, been together ever since till this year but it's all his fault he he was a great writer and we were broke and um, so he persuaded me to do some nude modeling and I enjoyed it and la di da I went on and on and on and I enjoyed shooting my girlfriends and it all, it was all supposed to be to make money for Humphrey for his writing but I kind of grabbed the center spotlight and he was, he was so so unlike you <laughs> to want like, to be the center of attention uh, crazy I, I know it, but he didn't can mind. i ask for a definition of half a virgin please half a virgin means it's sort of you kind of make love with well it was a gynecologist tiny gynecologist with a small penis Wait, okay, okay. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a story I have not heard. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, back up. Are you telling me that you lost your virginity to a gynecologist with a small penis? Yeah, I didn't really lose it because it was so small. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said I was half a virgin. Wait, wait, okay, when you say you didn't really lose it, like, did it not break your hymen? Or you just, like, I don't think so, no. It just, like, doesn't count. No, it doesn't I, I Either way, I don't know. It was in the back of a car, and he was... He wasn't your gynecologist, was he? No, no, no. It was okay. at the hospital. It was in the, it, it was, no, it was in the hospital. Can, oh, that's better. <laughs> well, okay, so this is when you were a nurse. Yeah, this is before I met Humphrey. And he was a gynecologist. He's this guy, yeah. And it was in the back of a car. Yeah. And he had a very small penis. Tiny. Like, how tiny are we talking? Come on. <laughs> that's like a micro penis. It was a micro penis. So that's was it really? Well, I don't know. But I suddenly didn't notice it. Wow. <laughs> People, I just, <laughs> I am just discovering that my mother lost her virginity to a micro penis. <laughs> and I the definition of micro penis is whether Sue's or not can notice it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this is before, by the way, that she started shooting porn. So she wasn't like. I was a nurse. Yeah. yeah so she, she, she wasn't. <laughs> Like she didn't have like huge dicks in front of her all day, and you know had a skewed perspective. This is this is before that, so um, wow, you know you learn something new about your parents every day, and oh, today is that day for me. That's <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> oh. Okay, so I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just that's okay. That was some interesting <laughs> information to absorb. <laughs> You're going to be seeing that micro penis in your dreams. I know, right? Like a tiny shark. Alan, do you have conversations like this with your parents? No. no. Uh, uh, my, my, my dad <laughs> uh, died quite a while ago, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, my mom is a fairly conservative Jewish woman. So okay. not so much. Mm. And th yeah, no birds and the bees talks. I just kind of <laughs> muddle through that by myself. Um, yeah. No. I'm just vulgar. Naturally, you know. Yeah, I know. Well, that's that's why we love you. Uh -huh. Okay, so sorry. So you, <laughs> we completely lost track. I was just so sidetracked by that story. Um, okay, so you have a virgin. You met dad, um, who did not have a micro penis. No, and it was jolly good. Ah, <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> yeah. Uh, my dad liked to walk around naked a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, anyways, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so you met him, and he wanted to be a writer, but you guys were broke. You were modeling at the time, and then what happened? 
um, I just started, I, photographer David Hearn told me to keep my clothes on. For heaven's sake, keep your clothes on, Suze. And so he got me in to do some fashion for Petticoat, and so I kept doing fashion. And, but, you know, I f it was okay, but it's kind of boring. Um, clothes on and everything, and it's very competitive, and they'll pick one person, not you, and da da da. It's n nudes are great because you know it's just you and the model. Um, so I enjoyed shooting, shooting my girlfriends behind the scenes, and then I started. Um, so, like, sorry, just real quick, I just want to make that distinction because you say nudes are great because it's just you and the model. So. It feels like to me, when you're shooting fashion, it's about the clothes, right? It's about the thing that you're selling. But when you're shooting nudes, it's about the girl, because you're selling the girl. It's all about the girl. And also, when you're shooting fashion, you've got lots of sort of self-important people mm. behind you who want to have a word and say this. When it's nudes, you keep them out. You know, you don't have anybody there. Mm -hmm. It's just you and a lighting guy and, and your model. So that's much, much sexier. Yeah, it's Agreed. a much smaller crowd. Mm -hmm. That's why I started doing it as well. <laughs> yeah, because you've because you've shot both. I mean, you've shot a lot of like commercial stuff. Yeah, and I still do a lot of. I mean, most of my work is commercial, but all of my personal work is fine art nude, um, and it's the same thing. I don't need to call. Don't need I don't need a, an assistant. Back. I don't need a capture tech. I don't need anything. It's just a it 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 kind of breaks the communication yeah, that you have yeah, yeah, totally. with your subject. You want them to be as as comfortable as possible. It's already a fairly uncomfortable thing, depending on who you're shooting. Some people are just amazing nudists. Um, but yeah, you don't, I think the more people that you have cluttering up the space, the more awkward it's going to oh, feel. Oh yeah, and they're trying to say something, be important, and you know, so what? You mm -hmm. know, piss off, just because you're the editor. Um. <laughs> just because it's your shoot. Just because you're the client. <laughs> yeah. Just because you're the person writing the checks. <laughs> who cares what you think? Um, so, um, okay, so you were modeling fashion, you found it a bit boring, and then? I was shooting my girlfriends, and Humphrey found Lillian Muller, a picture of Lillian Muller in the Sun newspaper, and we got her to come and see us, and she was so beautiful, and but very shy, actually, and didn't like shooting with other people so I shot her and she actually moved in into our apartment but all she did was eat chicken <laughs> um. there's, there's a lot of that in the book <laughs> Lillian and her chickens <laughs> which is weird because she's a vegan now I, uh, yeah, no, she's I, like a total like health, yeah, uh, not right. vegan. She I, actually looks so fucking amazing. She, she does look great. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Like she, that woman definitely took care of herself. She, she looks incredible. Uh, very good looking. Yeah. Yeah, I kept it every time I'd read, I've read the book twice, and I, every time I'd read that part, I just imagined uh, Mila Jojovich from uh, Fifth Element, where she like puts a little bean into a microwave and a whole chicken comes out and she just starts snacking on the chicken. I just kept imagining like Lily Miller in that little bandaged outfit, just eating chicken after chicken. But uh, Hef fell in love with her. Well, I showed her pictures to Victor Lowndes, who was, I was fox hunting with, um, he was the English head of Playboy. Um, showed him the pictures of Lillian Muller and he sent them to Hef, who fell in love with her. So guess what? Hef flew us both over to America. Um, he would never have flown me over had I been a man. It's such an advantage being a woman. So lucky. And then, of course, they tried to send me home because I didn't know what I was doing. But I was a good party girl. I could get everybody at the mansion dancing and fucking quickly instead of waiting half the night. Um, so I was popular. So before we go on about your um, storied Playboy career and ultimately what happened when um, you wrote the book, I would love to have you read an excerpt from your book. Um, I believe that you wanted to read the beginning of chapter two when you got into Vogue magazine as a model, which is kind of what started the whole thing because you used that money to buy yourself a camera, right? 
I think so. I don't know. Yes, that's, that's, <laughs> that is what happened. Okay, uh, chapter two, both sides of the camera. I think you can just read as long as you so want. Until I get bored. Yeah, until yeah. you get bored or until we get bored. <laughs> um, and uh, also, too, I just want to say for the viewers, we will be taking questions from the audience, but we're going to kind of wait until the end to do that. So if you've been putting questions in there and you are frustrated that they haven't been answered, um, just hold on to them and, and we'll take mm. questions from the audience. All right, here we go. Chapter two, both sides of the bloody camera. After my early successes, I was convinced that I was gonna make a fortune as a model and be a familiar face in every home. But I soon discovered that in the glamour game, the most difficult problem that confronts a new arrival is survival. Uh, sure, it felt great to average two to three big assignments a week, which on paper earned me three to five hundred dollars. But often I had to wait up to six months for the clients to pay up. By that time, I'd had m I'd more than spent what I was due to earn on clothes, makeups, all those extras which I hoped would make me look more like the jet-set beauty I wanted to be. Only the strongest survive. On top of the financial strain was the problem of learning to live with failure. Much of my week was spent walking the streets with my modeling portfolio, going from casting to casting. If one in 10 paid off, I was doing well, but it was always hard living with the fact that the other nine had turned me down. Television castings were the worst. Sometimes I joined a lineup of 50 girls, all looking their best, all hoping to get the job. It was like being for sale in a cattle market. I was obliged to be sweet and over-friendly to people to whom in another situation, I wouldn't give the time of day. There were many days spent sitting next to the phone, praying for that trip to the Bahamas that I and half the girls in town had auditioned for. Sometimes it seemed that the only face I had was the one I put on for the camera. And then it happened. I achieved every model's dream. I was booked to work for Vogue. I couldn't believe it. I had called at Vogue House a dozen times to show the editor my portfolio, but they always told me to bugger off. Um, my break came one afternoon when I was having a hamburger lunch with Humphrey in a trendy shopping arcade. I had very short platinum blonde hair, which was a head of fashion at the time. It was this that caught the sharp eye of Julia Fraser, one of Vogue's fashion editors. Hello, this pretty brunette of about 30 said, I'm taking a few snaps upstairs for Vogue Boutique. You know, Vogue's gossipy section? Oh yeah, I said, thinking she was some kind of amateur photographer. Trying, so I've got to find this bloody picture. Trying to sell me a line. Yes, you're a model, aren't you? I'm doing a few shots. How much do you pay? I asked coolly. She looked astonished. Most girls would have paid to get into Vogue. Why nothing, she began. Well, all right, I'll do it as long as it doesn't take too long, I said rather ungraciously. I enjoyed modeling for Julia. It was the first time I'd worked with a female photographer and I liked it. She was easier to communicate with than most of the men I worked for. Oh, so here we go. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Do you want me to go on? Um, not if you think that you've told enough. No, I was just tired of reading. Um, okay, well, you can, you can stop there if you want. Oh, um, had I known that the sweet lady photographing me was one of the fashion editors I was blasting, my attitude would have been completely different. But s instead of being sweet and fawning, I was angry and indignant. A week later, my astonished agent phoned me with the news that Vogue had booked me for a three-day modeling assignment with Clive Arrowsmith, one of London's top fashion photographers. He was great. Clive was an inspiration to work with. He was really good for a guy. 
He lay on the floor to make my legs look longer and had me leaping about like a ballerina. Later up at Vogue House, they told me they loved the pictures. They said they were going to run them for 12 pages, probably the longest spread on any girl since Jean Shrimpton. I began to believe I was about to be rocked to the top. Oh, I would be like a princess. I could do anything. Everything was possible. <sighs> Riding on a great wave of elation, I was swept down to a camera shop in nearby Bond Street. Encouraged by a clever salesman, I phoned my family bank manager back in Worcester and persuaded him to lend me the equivalent of $1,000, convincing both him and myself that I was going to be a famous photographer. This was probably the most daring and wisest move I'd made so far. Though it took me much longer than I expected to realize my dream, hard times, doubt and despair lay ahead. The first blow was that I didn't get the 12 pages. They reduced the pages and crammed them in the pictures and crammed them all into two pages. And most people didn't even recognize me. Oh, I did two more fashion seasons, sessions for the magazine, but they didn't go well and I was disheartened and address and depressed. Ah, so there we go. <coughs> okay, that was great. So, but you took that money and you went and bought a camera yeah. and started your whole career. So it's kind of funny how, you know, things well, I didn't work start out it. I, the camera just stayed in my bedroom for ages because I was so depressed. Um, but then I eventually got it out, and I never really learned how to work it. But I tried hard. I can I can attest to this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just still like, I mean, God forbid should I give her anything but her phone. She's like, oh, what the, the hell phone's is this? so much better. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I know you said you started shooting your girlfriends just kind of backstage. Yeah. Did you just kind of barge your way in with the camera how did you actually get were there was there permission that you need to get like now or not really you just sort of well i wouldn't barge my way in we 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 would be playing and they'd, they'd want to shoot with me i mean mm -hmm. i was fun i shot jerry hall too yeah we used to party but then she got married to all these rich people so i couldn't couldn't publish them but uh I still have the pictures, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Call us. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, I kind of got uh, something of my start, not actually starting shooting, but when I started to kind of shoot more celebrities, a lot of people have that kind of question, like how do you first get to shoot a celebrity? Yeah. And I did it by just showing up with a camera, an assistant, and a portable light and just, hi, can I just take your picture right but quick? But where did you show up though? Um, the in first, the dressing room. No, that would be nice. The first thing I ever did was, uh, I can't remember. Oh, so I shot, somehow a magazine hired me to shoot Neil Gaiman and Amanda Palmer's engagement photo. Mm. And then Neil invited me. He was on uh, a, a, one of Kevin Smith's podcasts when Kevin Smith first started to shoot. And he invited me to come and be in the audience. And this was very, this was about, I'd been shooting maybe for two years. And I rolled in with my uh, then fiance, as my assistant holding a light and a camera and I just kind of walked backstage and said, Neil said, Neil said it was okay for me to come back here and shoot. <laughs> and Kevin thankfully was like, huh? And I, and I went, you know, I would just love to shoot your portrait and I'll, I'll just give you uh, use of the pictures if you want. And he, that was, and that was what kind of sold him. He was like, oh, I can, we can use them for whatever we want. I was like, absolutely, a hundred percent. And so he had no sense of what, who I was. Uh, I did, I do remember seeing Neil kind of shaking his head and kind of hiding behind a curtain mm -hmm. once I rolled in with this like kind of like little like weird I don't know I, I, I like I, th I thought of it as sort of like being Bert from Ch uh, Mary Poppins with like all the musical instruments yeah, I just yeah, had yeah. all of my photo gear kind of attached to me oh, luckily um, I didn't have I just had a camera I didn't yeah, have a light I would have been smart but and then I took a good picture and so I think it what it came down to was shooting shooting a good portrait of Kevin so that when I sent that he went oh shit you actually know what you're doing and that, right that um, has been the answer to many to <laughs> <laughs> I mean I think there's something to be said too for like people who really take initiative like you have to otherwise you really just, have to because yeah. like people are not going to hand you like yeah. thing like anything on a platter like no. you have to go out and get it 
you know i mean even as Suze randall's daughter you know when i stopped when i decided to like branch out and start working for other people like i had to i went to twisties and i went to playboy and i was like i want to shoot for you um i will do it for free mm -hmm. and hopefully you will like my stuff and then you will hire me yeah and it was actually like twisties like rejected me a couple of times before they brought me on and then i was like their main photographer for 12 years but I mean, I had to, I had to go it's out It's funny. There. I think if we talked about it, we'd probably have a very similar story. Because, uh, And the only thing that I don't like about that story is that I've now been shooting for 15 years. And I still have to trot out that same fucking line every once in a while. Like, oh, I'll show up and I'll shoot it for free. And then hopefully you'll like it and hire me. And I'm like, God, can I, is there ever a time when I'll actually get to the point where yeah. I don't have to trot yeah. that, like, bullshit out? Like, this, <sighs> but I was so lucky. The answer yeah. is no. I could just give him a blowjob yeah yeah well, there I you tried go that too. you could yeah. just you could just fuck your way to the top like my mother did <laughs> or you wants could a blow job from me, you know i wasn't very good at it but still <laughs> i mean <laughs> i feel like some guys are just like look a blow job's a blow yeah, job yeah, you know it's like pizza it's well, i'll take it <laughs> speaking of blow jobs um before we continue on i want to give a shout out to my sponsors at blue chew um if you are a man who's been experiencing some issues in the bedroom then you might want to give blue chew a try there are times that you know men lose their confidence and they need a little bit of help i can say that you know my mother and i having worked in the porn industry for a long time we've come across the temperamental men's penis issues right mom they just need lots of women uh, but if you don't have lots of women you could try blue chew <laughs> <laughs> a lot less expensive, a lot less work. In fact, um, you can go online and you don't have to see a pharmacist or a doctor. One of their licensed medical providers will assess your case and will prescribe you the right prescription for you. And if this sounds too good to be true, then you can actually go to bluechew.com and try it for free. Pay only $5 in shipping. Just make sure that you use your code HOLLY. Okay, so now that we've let everybody know how they can uh, get, get it up, get, get it up without loads of women. And it's you've not... given Blue Chew their new ad campaign. Uh, <laughs> perfect slogan for Blue yes, Chew. Yes, yes. Unless you, if you don't have loads of women, um, try, try Blue, Blue Chew. Chew. <laughs> uh, so I want to move on in the story to when you actually wrote this book and what the fallout was from that. Well, Humphrey wrote this book. He just watched everything I did, and I just lived it. He wrote it. Um, and then we we were writing it while we were at Playboy, you know. Humphrey was allowed to go to Playboy with me because I wouldn't go if he didn't. To the Playboy mansion. So Hef would, like, famously not allow girls to bring their boyfriends. No. But he allowed me because I got all the parties going, and... Humphrey um, just sat in the background, got bored, and had another drink. And, uh, but he <laughs> he wrote it all down, and we told um, the secretary, Hef's secretary, that we were writing a book. But the problem with being rich and famous and so important is nobody ever tells you. I'm talking about Hef, never tells you anything that you might not like. So the secretary said, oh, it's fine. It's, you know, she thought everybody was writing a book and didn't realize what we were telling the <coughs> truth. Um, and she said, oh, as long as you don't talk about drugs. I said, well, no, because I don't do drugs with Hef. I don't know him that well. Um, maybe he'd like some of my LSD, but no. Um, so she just, we thought all the time I'd be nudge, nudge, wink, wink with Hef, thinking he knew what I was doing, and he had no idea. And so <laughs> when it came out, and I think it was the News of the World or something, um, a piece of the story, he had a fit. He spat in my face. Oh, he screamed, and he tried to get me to change the book, and I wouldn't do it, and oh, it was so, so much drama. What specifically did he want changed in the book, do you know? I never, never found out. I mean, we had long talks with Victor Lowndes and fights and everything. No, but I, I wasn't going to change anything. No way. I was just going to tell the truth. Mm. So um, he eventually threw me out. 
as someone who's read the book twice, it, it's surprisingly tame. You don't actually say anything particularly incriminating or bad about him, which no, is... No, no. He, he must have been a very sensitive soul when it comes to well, he uh, just being liked, talked about. He just liked the power. Or just, yeah, he just wanted yeah, control yeah, over the yeah, narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, there and, isn't a... And he was worried about the people who were in it and everything, and people not coming to his mansion. I mean, he he was a worrier, but he was a kind man. I I didn't have any bad things to say about him. He he was very generous and very kind to me, but he just, like all weak men, needed total control of everything. Yeah. There, so... Disclaimer, and I'm going to say this too because I'm actually going to read some excerpts from my mom's book for the first time live on air. Um, but I remember that I think dad said that you said that Hef, because you slept with Hef too, right? Well, I kind of fiddled his with other girls. I wasn't. Okay. I was three others or something. Okay, so you were just one of many. I was many. one of them. You never had a one-on-one session? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Hardly had a conversation with him. <laughs> but I heard that um, you wrote in the book somewhere that he had a fat bottom. Alan, oh, is that in there? That's the, about the, I was, that was going to say. It's like, that's like sort of the only thing that, I mean, it's so, and it's also tame as fuck. Like, it's, you're not like measuring his dick or anything like that. You just said he had a bubbly butt. But that's Which could a, be taken why as a compliment, is that a bad especially thing? if you're a white dude. Oh, he you just doesn't. doesn't like anything said about him that's not flattering. And do you remember exactly how it was said? Roughly, like, did, that, did like it a, sound like a disparaging comment? Slightly, I suppose, but hmm. I, I don't know. Maybe men were more concerned about their asses in the seventies. This is before big asses were exactly. Inside. Yeah, you didn't want to have a nice big juicy ass. I, I just guess. thought about his ass because that's all I ever saw. Is when he's trying to hump. <laughs> 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 um, Alan, I believe hmm. that you have a copy of the book with yeah. some pieces highlighted that you believe I should read. Would you want to pick your most offensive one? I don't know if it's the most offensive, but it's pretty good. It's pretty good? Okay. So just to bring you all up to speed here, um, this is me reading a excerpt from my mother's memoir for the first time. I've never read this book because there's a lot of sex in here, and as much as like I fully embrace the fact that my parents were swingers and they had a lot of sex. Obviously, I was raised in a sex-positive family. I am a sex-positive person. I work in the sex industry. I have a sex-positive podcast. Um, I felt like I didn't need to necessarily read about my mom's um, oh God, no. exploits in detail, but I'm going to do it now for you. So um, How here we go. <laughs> oh, It's my life being embarrassed by my family. <clears throat> All right. The door was opened by a seedy 60-year-old with thin gray hair and teeth that flashed with gold fillings when he smiled. Hello, sweetheart, he crooned. I'm Sydney. Come in. Come right on in. This was obviously Dee's sugar daddy. I was beginning to get cold feet. What on earth is my date, or whatever they're called, going to be like? I saw Dee, a voluptuous, tardy blonde, standing next to an armchair. Cooey! What the fuck is that? She said, (laughs) giving a little wave. Wedge into the armchair was one of the fattest, most repulsive men I'd ever seen. He rose ponderously to his feet, a cigar as thick as a banana in one fist. This is Bill, Sidney said, guiding me over to my $50 daddy. Sidney must have seen a look of despair on my face, for he immediately poured me enough vodka to stun a horse. I gulped it down like lemonade, determined to get blotto as quickly as possible. We sat down to a lunch of salmon and champagne, which cheered me up a lot. See, I like salmon. (laughs) <laughs> then came the show. Dee led the romp, giggling and wiggling out of her clothes, a real pro. By now I was roaring drunk, but I still fell out of place. I mimicked Dee's strip tease as if it was some child's game of follow the leader. When we were down to bra and panties, I had to go to the bathroom. Dee followed me. Realizing that this wasn't at all my cup of tea, she said, Darling, you know you don't have to go through with this. If you want to, you can call it all off now and split home. No chance, I said. Stiff upper lip, never say die and all that. I've come a long way, and besides, I really do need the money. We (laughs) wriggled and giggled our way back into the room, and after a few squeaks, winks, and hoots of laughter, perched ourselves on the two old men's laps. Conscious that time was passing and that if I drank any more, I was going to pass out, Dee pushed me and blubbery Bill into a darkened bedroom and shut the door. 
I couldn't see much, and the room kept going around and around. Thank God it was all over in five minutes, just as Vicky had predicted. Instantly, Bill lay back down and began to snore. Despite my drunken condition, I scooted out into the empty living room and got dressed, wondering how I was going to get paid. I needn't have worried. When I opened my bag, it was there in five-pound notes. I escaped into the gray winter's afternoon, hailing a cab on the embankment. The next thing I remember was the cab driver waking me. I was home. I tottered up the stairs and fell into bed. When I awoke a few hours later, it all seemed like a bad dream. I reassured myself by taking another look at the money. Hello, composite. I said to myself, rolled over, and went back to sleep. Composites are like the... Modeling composite. The modeling. Oh, okay. Okay, I was not, I was not getting that. So... <clears throat> I'll get a better one, for another one. Oh, to me. Okay, well, I just want to point out the fact that that is, um, so, Mom, you uh, you were, as, as we say nowadays, you were doing an in-person sex work service. Yeah, I needed the money. I only ever did it once, but um, I was quite, I was quite good at fat old men, because when Hum and I went to the swinging parties in Amsterdam and everything, a lot of the people there were unattractive. Mm. Um, so you ended up being a goddess of love and just fucking them all, you know? Mm. And then you floated above. You <laughs> floated above their ugliness. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's interesting, because I did not know that you had ever um, had sex for money. But, you know, I'm, I'm as, as, as shocking as this might be for some people, I, I'm not that shocked and don't actually really care that much. But um, how did that make you feel? A little bit richer. <laughs> a little bit richer. But like, did you feel, like, how did you feel afterwards? Did you regret it? Did you feel shameful about it? No. Or, no? No, I mean, we, I needed the money. No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm like I all for, like, I, I'm super positive about sex work in all its forms. So I'm definitely not somebody who's going to talk down about like any form of prostitution. Yeah, but I wasn't going like to that. I wasn't going to do it again. <clears throat> I mean. Right. So then you just went to orgies and then had sex with unattractive uh, men for free. We'd been doing that beforehand, I think. I can't remember <laughs> when we went to Amsterdam and all those swinging parties. I don't know. So you called yourself a goddess of love. So did you you felt I mean, this was just like your generous spirit coming out. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, um, yeah, because most people wouldn't fuck or, or you know, it's The like, unattractive man. Oh, so that's yeah. so nice of uh, you. Well, it's kind of an English thing. Like, you, oh. you no, well, you learn. Oh, it's, it's, party, it's manners. So. Manners. Polite. Good manners, yeah, talking to Polite. people who are being ignored. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good swinger manners. Yes, yeah. good swinger <laughs> manners. You go and you have sex with the ugliest people in the room so they don't feel left out. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> To be fair, that's probably one of the kindest things that you can do. Indeed. <laughs> it was pretty good. Oh, Mom, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so I, I quickly just pulled this one out okay. because uh, well, I, rem I remember oh, reading. Not that. Oh, not that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't do that quickly. Oh, come on. There's a lot of zippers in my pants. Um, <laughs> uh, you get to tug it. It's all the yeah, way I down there. Exactly. Oh, just, uh, yeah, like, let's have a good laugh. Thanks. <laughs> Why do I feel like that ugly guy in the orgy room? Maybe you uh, see blue chew. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I remember reading this little part and loving the fact that uh, I think anyone who's, I think, in a more mainstream world, and I know this is a kind of a broad generalization, but my experience is I just shoot fine art nude. I don't actually do any, anything in the adult industry, obviously not that I would care one way or the other but I think that there is this sort of strange understanding that if you're in the adult industry and you are uh, you you work in that realm that you're just a nymphomaniac all the time mm -hmm. and the reality is yeah. like it's it's a job for a lot of people it's mm -hmm. something that they're good at um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you want to fuck everybody all the time no in fact um, in the nude industry they're much politer to the models than in the fashion agency yeah that not surprised oh. um, but I love that in, in this thing you're uh, your mom is basically scandalizing the like unscandalizable for mm. lack of a better term. Okay. Oh, what did I do? I don't know. I guess we're going to find, find out. out. 
Um, okay, we're about to get going, yelled Josh Blake, one of Playboy's two associate art directors. Let's get the arrangement right. Towels were dropped and naked bodies piled on top of each other until those at the bottom were howling that the wind was being squashed out of them. Eventually, we were all arranged to Josh's artistic satisfaction and the strobe began to pop. I've been to a couple in my time, but this is in no way like an orgy, I confided to James. We look like the leftovers of a mass murder. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. With an effort, I heaved myself out of the wriggling heap and buried my head in James's crotch. That's great, yelled Ed. Looks very realistic. Suze, just lift your left knee a little higher. What do you mean, looks realistic, gasped James as I put my lips around his flaccid prick. <laughs> yeah, she's giving him a blowjob, someone called excitedly. All heads turned to me in utter amazement. A girl sucking off a guy during a Playboy pictorial. Is this true? Oh, I'm sure it was, yeah. Jesus <laughs> Why such an outrage was completely unheard of. Softcore sex was one thing, but hardcore shudder. Okay, calm down, everybody, Ed commanded to kill the nervous giggles. Let's wrap this up and go home. But we don't want to go home, cracked some sniggering smartass. Once they'd gotten over the shock of breaking the sex barrier, the kids began to enjoy themselves, although some of the girls looked worried about what they'd let themselves in for. Since I wasn't getting much of a rise out of James, I slithered over to the side of the platform where Andy was lying. Going to get into my friends tonight, I winked at him, snuggling down into the 69 position. Wow, was all he had time to say as I proceeded to treat his cock like a lolly, which, unlike a lolly, got warmer and bigger every time I licked it. <laughs> oh, Dad. I mean, it's funny because I read this and I know this is like a story about my mom, but like this is my dad's voice. Like, 100%. yeah. <laughs> and also, like, I just want to point out the fact that, you know, it was very important for me to to put this memoir back out, you know, through this Kickstarter campaign that we're doing um, in the memory of my father who passed away in January because it was really important to him to put this back out and. It's actually been kind of like a really bittersweet thing for me to see how well it's done. And like the fact that he's not here oh, no. to like, like he would be, I know I just read a passage about my mom giving a guy a blowjob, but I'm going to cry right now. Um, he would be like, so, I mean, I can't tell you over the, how over the moon he would be, you know, like this would. He is over the moon. Yeah. I mean, this would, this would mean a lot to him. So, and is like, strange as I recognize that it might seem that I'm getting like emotional about a book that my dad wrote about my mother having sex with other people <laughs> 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 like this is all you know to me like in this book I was just I see like a lot of my dad's like love and admiration for my mom and sex was one thing but their bond was something that could not be broken and it was born out of like respect and mutual admiration and, like a really deep-seated love and he was so kind. We miss you a lot, Dad. Hmm. Um, so I have a special treat for you guys before we, we go and take um, questions from the audience. I brought a book that nobody's ever seen before and nobody's ever heard read out loud before. Oh, there, there goes my Factor Meals smoothie, which was so delicious. And by the way... If you want to take charge of your eating um, and, you know, conveniently uh, get meals delivered right to your door, you can go to factor75.com. I think that's the website. They didn't officially sponsor this episode, but they are sponsoring me. Um, and use code HOLLY and you get some kind of discount. I can't remember what it is, <laughs> but it's some kind of discount. But I do actually eat these all and I drink these all the time. Mom can attest to this. These are like the little meals that I always bring out when, oh, I know. when my help. husband's not around to like cook. Filled up in my fridge. Yeah, I know. Oh. They sent me a lot of meals. I have to have to give them to my dogs. I had uh, no, you don't <laughs> give them to your dogs because they're healthy, calorie conscious meals that um that I absolutely love. Now you're making me thirsty. Oh. Do you want something to drink? Yes. Masha is is Masha away? still here? Okay, Ernie, can you grab um, my mom and I uh, maybe perhaps some liquid deaths out of the fridge? 
What about you? Uh, you, uh, you know what? I'll take some death too because we uh, we love liquid yeah. death. So we we. Want sparkling or regular? Ooh, I can I get this? If we have sparkling, I'll take sparkling. Uh, ditto, but I don't care either way. Okay. I don't care. Okay. If I if you have a convicted uh. melon, just because that is the literal best name for a fucking. Uh, <laughs> they have uh, water such cl- they have such clever names. Oh my god, I love it. Does Masha go home? Um, possibly. Okay, so everybody, this is my mom's diary from when she was in her twenties. Oh no, really? Yes, and I actually found this when I was uh, start trying to like clear out some junk out of your guys' room, and Dad was actually in the room with me. And I was clearing stuff out, and I found this, and Dad and I sat down together and we read this, and we, oh. uh, man, we had a good laugh. This is, um, oh. this is some really great stuff. It's gonna be a twenty thousand dollar reward on the Kickstarter. Oh my God, the, this is this is too precious. I cannot get. <laughs> I can't believe I wrote all those pages. Oh you actually God. didn't write enough. There's not that many pages in here, sadly. Um, oh, I'm not gonna read all of it because it's too oh, much. But, don't. um, but it's actually like, Mom, you're a good writer. Yeah. Like really, you were. Um. So <laughs> maybe. <laughs> oh, boy. So this actually, okay, so this is in Corsica. This is September 11th, 1970. It's dated and everything. And this kind of goes back to your modeling days because it's interesting. It actually talks about um, uh, what you mentioned earlier about the modeling industry being so competitive and that kind of stuff. So it's really like spelled out here in this diary entry. Oh, thank you. All right. Shit, it's hard working and playing with strange people 24 hours a day for seven days. Either Robin gets the sulks or I do, as we can't both hog the limelight at the same time. (laughs) It's amazing however much you profess friendship for another girl, it still always ends up in competitive animosity. You eye the other girl, gnash your teeth and say, I wish I was as pretty as you. Well, that's Robin's line, which is proving to be a bit of a drag, especially as she's hogged all the best clothes, best shots, plus the photographer. Must admit, I'm getting a few of my old loose foot wings on this trip. Oh, old lost feelings on this trip. At least I do keep them to myself. Here's a stiff upper lip coming in. (laughs) Yesterday, happened to have a good day in front of the camera, and Madam threw a real sulk drove off in the car to gain attention, spilling the contents of my bag along the road. When I shouted at her, she sulked for hours. And it wasn't until I discussed the, that I've mentioned previously in a friendly manner, plus the promise of her wearing my best wig that she came around. (laughs) Still, it's obvious that women just don't mix. Not young, secure ones, any insecure ones, anyways. The feeling I am feeling today are very common to those of my sex, and the only answer seems to be to think of them, control them, and then maybe one day I'll forget them. Anyways, if we go dancing tonight, that'll make Robin throw a sulk because when I dance, I really know I'm fantastic. God, what a competitive little bugger I am. No wonder <laughs> H cakes me a pub bra- oh h calls me a pub brawler that must be dad yeah hum calls me a pub brawler so there is a oh this is funny oh this is funny okay uh this is september 19th 1970 fuck what a day crawled out of bed splashed my makeup on and luckily caught a taxi all the way to an early audition anyhow i got the stupid job only because the other girl was so late and then worked as a cheesy hair, air hostess. Didn't enjoy it at, for a start, and I don't enjoy having my legs exposed to the elements, let alone the camera. Because of this job, the rest of my day was messed up. Bill What's It wasn't in for lunch, so walking along Holborn, I was easy prey for a smooth Israeli who kindly carried my basket. I was so bored, I ended up having lunch at Claridge's with him. Seeking simulation and finding him rather dull, I entered into his flirtation games over the table. I never intended to end up in his bed in his impressive Mayfair apartment, but after much grappling, I thought I'd see if he was any good in bed. He wasn't. (laughs) Brought me down a bit, as mistakes always do, but I think it was more the fact that my moles have been 
rem the, my moles that have been removed don't look too good. So you had moles removed on your skin. I tell people that my boyfriend burnt my face with a cigarette. It sounds much better. <laughs> That was my dad. <laughs> Anyways, it goes on. I won't read all of it, but um, there's some, I mean, you just, like, basically, you sleep with, like, five different guys in the span of, like, eight oh. pages. Exercise. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is, this is a really, this is a really great find, I have to say. Indeed. Maybe we will do something with copying these pages or something. I was going to say we should maybe at least like pull a few passages off and just yeah. sort of, I don't know, Cause there's do some, something with it. There's definitely mm -hmm. some funny stuff in here. I did think it's it's something that, this is something we'll talk about once the Kickstarter's over, but I love the idea of breaking up some of the photography pages in the limited edition book with mm -hmm. little quotations from you, but maybe instead of taking it from the memoir, we actually take it from... I thought it'd be more fun to, because the memoir only goes up to Playboy, and then right. we kind of pick up where Playboy leaves off because we can't use any of those images, unfortunately. Right, because that was the one magazine that she worked for that did own everything. Yeah, that I thought it might be fun to just talk a little bit about what happened afterwards and include the, just a few, co you know, we could talk and I could record it and you could just regal me with your glorious stories Whatever that you remember. probably will remember. I remember about Larry Flynn. He was, <laughs> he was fun, but still. <laughs> His but wife it was, was even better. All right. His Willie was better? His no, his wank. wife. Oh. His wife. Oh. Oops, yeah. I didn't hear that. Oh, do you want to tell the Althea story? Sure. <laughs> okay. So this is a humorous story about Larry Flint's first wife, Althea. If you've seen The People versus Larry Flint, she was the woman played by Courtney Love, um, probably considered, like, the greatest love of his life. Oh, she was totally... She was. She died from AIDS. Yeah, I think it was also from a blood transfusion yeah, too. Yeah, it wasn't she got even. It, she, she was into drugs, but it wasn't from drugs. No, it, it was, was from a blood, blood transfusion in yeah, the, hospital, it was the hospital. Ironically, yeah. bloody doctors. Yeah, <coughs> uh, she was amazing out there. She was very, very aggressive. I mean, Larry was scared stiff of her. He would uh, often say, oh, "Althea's going to shit on me," and he meant it literally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we were at a party and she and I got on very well because I wasn't scared of her or whatever. Um, and she dragged me into a bathroom and wanted me to give her head. And I said, no, I'm not very good at it. Um, you give me head. So I sat on the toilet and she gave me head. And then the door opened. Uh, poor photographer, another photographer from Asda, opened it. <gasps> was petrified. But he was so thankful afterwards that it was me sitting on the loo and Althea couldn't see him. Because had it been the opposite, he would have been fired. Um, <laughs> So he, he was thrilled. Oh, thank God you were the one getting head. You saved this man's job. Who yeah. would have known? What a noble thing for you to do. Oh, I'm very noble. <laughs> All right, guys. So um, we will take questions from the audience if you have them. Um, I have opened up the chat. I do know that some of my Patreon members also um, left some questions. I just don't have the app on here for some bizarre reason. So I need to open it in a browser, which I can't find. I'm sorry. Oh, sound I, like me. I very, I very <laughs> rarely use my iPad. This is mostly just for Violet to watch um, a cartoon so I can do her goddamn hair. Because <laughs> otherwise I can't get her to sit still. Uh, so let's see. Alan, do you have any questions for my mom until... Hmm. Oh, don't start him. He never stops talking. I know. Yes, yeah. he's been I'm talking real so chatterbox. much this entire <laughs> episode. <laughs> just wow. Just it's all Alan. I actually, you know what? I do have a question. It's and it's probably that's not super related to anything we've been talking about. What made you decide to turn in your camera and retire? Oh, I got kicked in the face huh. by one of my horses. I lost an eye. It seemed like a good excuse. I think you had quit before then, though. Yeah, she got kicked in the face by a horse on right. her birthday, nonetheless. Yeah, when I close my good eye, mm -hmm. you look really handsome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I'll tell my mom. 
<laughs> she just needs to get kicked in the face in the horse. And like a handsome son, finally. But I mean, photography was, I mean, it was great in my day, but now with digital, everybody and their grandmother is a photographer. So, you know, it's better when things are banned and not allowed. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, no, it's too, sex is too acceptable. It's really annoying. It's definitely much different than it was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's even more fun now that the iPhone has gotten so good that people don't feel like they need photographers at all. No, they don't. Oh, wait till AI fun. takes over. Oh, uh, now then we're all just out of the job. Well, not me, because I'm working on a metaverse project. There you so go. I'll there be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I do have a question in here. Uh, let me pull it up. Where did you go, sir? Stephen. Okay, so Stephen Chamberlain asks, is there any plans for making a movie about your life story? Oh, there's been a plan for 20 years. Yeah. But Hollywood, trying to get anything done, that's bullshit. You have to wait until you're dead. <sighs> yeah, I mean, so... I'm basically trying to scalp that from you guys. So I think, yeah. <sighs> So we are currently in contract negotiations with a company that I can't name yet because we haven't signed anything. Oh, they um, haven't given us any money, and who well, knows? nobody gives you money until you sign something. <laughs> so, but uh, it nonsense. looks like it will probably go ahead, um, and that will, but that will be a documentary. So once the documentary is made, generally it's easier to find people interested in doing like a series or a feature film on you once the documentary gets out there and gets some attention so um we will see but yeah i mean it's kind of crazy we've it's not even like we've been trying to sell her life story we've been approached about her life story and selling it god for as long as i can like 20 years honestly we signed so many shopping agreements and it's just like it's never gone anywhere it's crazy well, hollywood is crazy it's, 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 oh nonsense <clears throat> okay so um hugo uh one of my patreon members thank you hugo he asks how did she learn about microdosing and that it helps uh deal with drunkenness oh that was humphrey again who discovered that we used to take quite a bit of lsd in those days um and we went to a party at victor lounge's um in London, he was the head of Playboy in London, and I used to fox hunt with him, and right, I got on really well with him. So we went to one of his big parties. We took John Price along with Humphrey, who was a psychiatrist, and everything. Everybody had a lot to drink, but the only people that were still sober was Hum and me, because we'd taken a bit of LSD. So then Humphrey realized that LSD was an antidote to alcohol. And he discovered, he made it up. He put 20 drops of water in an eyedropper vial and one tab of acid. And I'd just take one drop of uh, the water, LSD water, and it, I'd stay sober. So he gave me that to take when I came out here to Playboy and I was alone, Humphrey wasn't here. So it was terrible to be alone as a woman and get drunk and y you can't rape them all, they can rape you. So I took the microdosing and I could outdo everybody at the mansion, partying and everything. It was, uh, it was really cool. <clears throat> yeah, um, I tried to get you and dad to get back into like microdosing. Um, I had a friend who had access to some and and you guys never took it. Well, Daddy would have, but I, you know, I, I turned into a no, 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 old woman that's instead true. of a yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's true. She become very prudish. No, well, I had to, I had to look after your father, and then I it was too extreme. It's a shame. Yeah. All right. Um, another question from a Patreon member. Um, this is from. Michael and Hugo did ask another question, but um, his questions kind of tied up in Michael's and I want to give Michael a shout out because he's been a big supporter for a long time. Uh, he says, hi, Suze, I got my first glimpse of you from the Ginger Lynn E! True Hollywood story in 2002. I admire you being a trailblazer in a male dominated industry. My question is, do you think as a woman you would break into a male dominated industry in the late 70s and 80s. And this kind of ties into Hugo's question. 
of how did she remain so assertive in a male-dominated industry? Um, I was always assertive. I was encouraged by my parents to be assertive. I was encouraged by them to fight the teachers who were being mean and to rebel, and my parents really totally supported that attitude, and I used to protect I protected Dave Mason. We were at school together, kindergarten, and he was bullied. And I used to protect him. I used to go into the men's bathrooms and chase them all out. And yeah, I was, I grew up that way. So it was natural for you. It was natural, but you also have to microdose a little bit so you don't get drunk and then you get soppy. Right, so remain in control yeah. is the key here. Uh, okay, Travis asks, which magazine did you like shooting for a best? Playboy or Hustler, or were there any others that you prefer over them? I have no idea. I liked shooting for myself and then selling them afterwards. I mean, if you shot for Playboy, you had to, oh, you were so scared. Oh, were they gonna like it or were they not? Oh, da, 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 da. Um, Hustler didn't really matter so much. Um, but shooting for myself was the best. Yeah. Because I owned it. <laughs> and that was like, I mean, that was some incredible foresight because you were the only person who did that. You know, like so many other photographers, like Artie Freytag, you know, Playboy owned all of his content. Earl Miller, Penthouse owned like almost all of his content. And so when the internet came along, you had this massive private library of content that you could now monetize on a completely different platform that nobody saw coming well uh, that was only because I was so badly behaved you know they threw me out Playboy threw me out I fought he, although I love Larry Flint I fought with Larry Flint um, Penthouse was really great but they went broke they was they owed me seventy thousand um, dollars so Bob Guccione as he was a photographer he was very kind he gave me the rights to my pictures for Penthouse because he owed me all this money. So I ended up owning those. I was able to put them on the internet and then nobody else would work with me. So I shot for myself and sold to High Society and all the little magazines, but I owned the pictures, so. Yeah. Um, bad behavior pays off well sometimes. Sometimes, that is the key word is sometimes. Always. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so M Mizomi Photography uh, says, Woohoo, just back the Kickstarter. Looking forward to reading her memoir and gaining inspiration from the photo book. Does the photo book include behind the scenes of how the shoots were done? I have no idea. <laughs> that, no. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would just shoot my pictures and then move on. All these bossy people are putting it all together. I don't know. When I look at my pictures, I'm quite amazed, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Le legitimately like she looks up she goes I shot this I'm like yes you shot this she goes I was pretty good <laughs> but I mean I will say like from somebody who learned from you you know working on set is even though you didn't necessarily know how to turn on the strobes or like attach the light modifier you knew where you wanted light like you knew if you wanted more light here or if you wanted more light there or where you wanted it or you haunted it to look like, like you knew exactly what you wanted. You didn't necessarily know all the technical steps to get you there, but you knew what you wanted. So when you say like you didn't know what you were doing, that's not exactly true. No, yeah. I was good, good with light. Well, I, as long as I had a good assistant, I could boss them around and get I, them. I feel like you did the, you were good at the hardest stuff first because I don't know how, I mean, I'm sure everyone's career is different, but I started just with all the technical stuff. I wanted to be as good at lighting as I could. And I feel like it took me 10 years to get to the place where I realized that communicating with your subject is actually the most important oh, part you, of photography. Yeah, and you just started out doing that. And I you're think only as good as your model feels, you know? Yeah. And also just filling it. the face and filling the pussy. And I had a really great lighting. Using chewing gum to open the pussy lips. Oh, <laughs> right. Yes. I had a great lighting Couldn't quite get assistant. that into the Kickstarter video, sadly. I, uh, I do not believe this is true. That's why I couldn't get it um, in I never because lie. in the background you kept yelling, that's a lie, that's a lie. <laughs> that's a lie, you <laughs> didn't like, use chewing gum to it. hold open the vagina. Damn it, Holly. Mom, stop lying. <laughs> well, you said like, 
Sure. Look, okay, let's just talk about this from like a <laughs> logistical standpoint. The chewing gum is not um it's not adhesive enough. No, that's true. But especially so with we, the skin. We, we did try glue. Glue would work better, but that also sounds like a terrible no, idea. I know. We, what we, kind of we, glue did you use? I don't know. Like Elmer's <laughs> spirit glue. I tried glue, but that didn't seem like a good idea. So then we did try. Who did you, you try? Who did you try glue on? Oh, some victim. <laughs> 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 we were experimenting because it's just so difficult to open the pussy with ugly hands or big fingers there and everything. It's just so much nicer if it's. Open and just welcoming. Open by itself, like an orchid. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think you ever perfected that because I never saw you do that. So I don't think I perfected all it. But I was, I was experimenting. All of these experiments to try to we do have, it. We failed. have our first yes. Kickstarter challenge. Can, who can <laughs> succeed in keeping a pussy open? I with mean, whatever you know, material you want, you there, win a free book. There's been, you know, leaps and bounds in um, different materials. I mean, I think like eyelash glue, maybe. Sure, spirit gum. Yeah, uh, I mean. Liquid latex, maybe. E, I've heard um, coming off them. Like toupee tape. <laughs> so we're giving you guys ideas. Oh, well. <laughs> if you guys figure it out, let us yeah. know. <laughs> uh, Danny Hill says, um, hi, everyone. Who was Sue's inspired by when she started as a photographer? The bank. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, so here, here's the thing, like, it's funny because when people, before they know you or they meet you, they really want to believe that you're somebody who was very particular about your craft and all like these technical ways, that you had like a photographer that you were inspired by, that you had someone that you looked up to and tried to emulate, that you had a favorite camera or a favorite light or, or whatnot, and like, it's like none of those things. I mean, you talk about how you were very much in the moment when you were shooting and then you never looked at your pictures afterwards. Like the final result almost like didn't matter to you. Yeah, because I was getting the final result as I was shooting. I was draping and m moving the model and making her feel great. Yeah, the model was the most important thing. I will say as someone who's watched it, I did manage to find a couple of BTS videos on your website, and I have to believe that m somehow uh, Mike Myers, before doing Austin Powers, s was subscribed to Suze.net and <laughs> saw those because you sound exactly like female Austin Powers, and yep. I mean literally to a T. Yep. I, I love don't that even you know who he is. He's an international man of mystery and leisure. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm but when he takes. <laughs> He's a comedy spy, but when he takes pictures, he sounds exactly like you, it, down to the accent. Me. Yep, down to the accent. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure. Accents uh, I, help. Somebody needs to go and do that research, but I feel like he has a secret Suze.net subscription that yeah, he isn't probably. telling anybody about. I agree, I agree. That I love that you actually make more, I feel like I wanna try and incorporate this into my own style, I just don't think I can post 2017. You make more noise than the subjects do. Oh yeah. Which oh. is really fun. Well, that's why I wasn't allowed to do video. For me, they, they maybe not for you, but for because... me it was great. Okay, yeah. When we started shooting video, we had to kick her out because <laughs> obviously we're rolling sound. And she, she, she wouldn't like really direct. She'd just stand there, light a cigarette, and just start moving her hips like she was in the scene. And she went, yeah, baby, yeah, that's how Faster, you do it. Deeper. That's right. I'm like, mom, we're rolling sound. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> get her out of here, get her out of here. So yeah, literally she would come, shoot the pictures and I would send her home and I would not let her stay for the video because she could not keep her fucking mouth shut. <laughs> so annoying. Okay, um, next question is from Pat B. He wants to know what project were you proudest of? I don't know. Your children. <laughs> this is what you the say. breeding. Yeah. Your children. <laughs> my <laughs> your greatest accomplishment yeah, were my, your children, so specifically the eldest one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, breeding was the best. <laughs> you know, I, um, I interviewed Veronica Hart at the launch party. Oh, I love her. Which was really cool because I hadn't seen her in such a long time. And she said something to me that, I don't know, really stuck with me. I think they, it's funny because you made an impression on people 
in a way that like really profoundly affected them. Like Ginger Lynn's talked about that. And and you oh, literally sobered her up. <laughs> and you literally like don't remember these things. Like you don't I don't think you realize that the, the effect that you've had on people. Like it it's really like just kind of goes over your head. Um, but Veronica said that you were the first person who told her that she could have a family and still work in the adult industry. And she did actually. I used to work with Veronica Hart on Jim Malibu sets uh, for Adam and Eve. And this was actually the first time I left like the little Sue's cocoon and started shooting for other people. I started working for Jim Malibu at Adam and Eve first. And Veronica used to do um, his productions and her son used to work on set as a PA. And he was, he was really nice, he was a good kid. And um, yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting too because when I got away from like the studio with like your assistants and your stuff, I mean, let's be honest, like when I first started shooting, you just like handed everything to me on a platter, you know, like I just had all of her people and I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just like pressed the button on the camera and like pictures came out. I eventually like learned everything and taught myself everything, but I definitely had an easy start. So when I left there, and then started going and shooting by myself. I remember like doing the first on-set production stills for Adam and Eve, and, I, and I, that's when I realized that I really didn't know what I was doing. Like, oh my God, like, you know what I mean? Like the light, mm -hmm. like how close the light should be, how far away it should be, in terms of like how that makes a difference. Like it was just, and of course, it was about the movie, not about the pictures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were like, take the pictures and get the fuck out of here. Yeah. So it's not like I had time to work on it. But that was a real like, that was kind of like a sink or swim. But it was a good learning experience for me. <clears throat> I'm always trying to encourage people to breed. I know you are. There's too many people in the world, though, so no, I don't know not. if that's such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a serious conversation going on in the chat right here about um, the best, like still going on about the best adhesive to use to good. hold yeah. vagina lips open. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like people are very much good. like. This is the Kickstarter challenge. Like, <laughs> I've been looking for one, and we finally found one. <laughs> Who among you can do hands-free open vagina? You win a prize. Uh, Cullion says, maybe a little rigid collodion, sparingly applied at the outer labia edges. It dries and pulls the skin. Could work. Ah. Hmm. Why didn't she tell me that 20 years ago? I don't know. Maybe because that didn't exist 20 years ago. <laughs> might, be, it might be a new thing. Blue Chew? Blue Chew. Blue Chew will definitely... Not a lot of people, and you need your pussy open. Yeah. Try Blue Chew. You know, Blue Chew would be great because with your now fully erect penis, you can part that labia yourself. Indeed. <laughs> $5 shipping costs only. Try it for free. BlueChew.com slash Holly. Or use code Holly at checkout. Just saying. Okay. Well, I think um, I think we've covered everything. Oh, um, please. I need to pee. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, liquid death. Um, well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you for all of your questions. Um, Alan, thank you so much for not just joining us today, but putting this together and like That's helping us. It is, oh, it has been my pleasure. Realize oh. this. It's been, um, it's been really cool. And can you tell everybody just again, like where they can find the Kickstarter project and, and all of that? Because I know some people who weren't here at the beginning and mm. probably just logged in now. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I think if you go to Kickstarter and use the search yeah. uh, query, it, just look for, it's Suze Randall, Naked and Unashamed. Yeah, and we'll also, we'll add the link in the description um, and a pinned comment on this video. But yeah, just go, literally just go to Kickstarter and Google Suze Randall and it will come up yeah. right away. It ends December 17th. So if you don't get your pledges in now, you will not get these limited edition books. They will not exist. We will be republishing her memoir in its kind of original format on Amazon down the road, but those will not be autographed. They will not be numbered. They will not be limited editions. They will not come with the special behind the scenes photos. They will not come with a limited edition photo book. So you really want to jump on this opportunity now because you will be missing out. Mom, is there anything that you want to say to your fans before we go? Uh, oh, thank you for still being interested in this old fart. <laughs> Here's me talking to the light. 
<laughs> Your camera is uh, right there. Uh, I never know which one. <laughs> yeah, can we give you a cigarette and you can just start oh, moaning and saying, <laughs> wriggling your butt? I'd love to get a cigarette. Actually. No, bad for you. <laughs> no, I haven't had a cigarette smoking. in years. Yeah, we, we do not let her smoke anymore. Oh, I don't you can just get her those little candy ones and then huh. she can just do, I just, I'm looking more for the motion than the actual mm, smoke. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Thank um, you. And of course, uh, you can join Suze.net to see all of her work um, archived there. Um, all of her work is up there. Alan, where can people find you online? Um, I think all my handles are uh, at Alan Amato. Alan Amoto. Amoto. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to say that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, my books are on alanamato.work. Um, my commercial work is alanamato.com. Uh, and a little bit thanks to you. I also I'm on I episode three of my own podcast that I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but it's yes. been a really fun little thing. I did a, an art documentary and I'm trying to do a little podcast just talking with fellow artists about uh, why it's very difficult and why it's very fun to do this for a living. You've got some pretty big names mm -hmm. on there, too. Do you want to, like, name drop a couple of your guests uh, so people know that they should definitely go watch it? Sure. Well, uh, th uh, we started with Kevin Smith, which was great. He's a delightful fellow who was nice enough to let me interview him. Um, followed with Mark Mangini, who's an Oscar-winning sound designer. Uh, and I just released Molly Crabapple, who's an amazing artist and author. Uh, and then next, I so next is Neil Gaiman, which is a big one. And then I'm Hoping, I'm, I'm waiting to get a response from him. He's agreed to, he's agreed to do it, but uh, he's a little hard to pin down. It will be Mike Mignola, the creator of Hellboy. Um, and then I, I have Billy Bob Thornton, Amanda Palmer, and Ben Folds all kind of queued up. So I did a few in advance because I was scared that, like, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to find. I don't, I don't know anything about this. I'm like, how do I find a guest? How do I do this? How do I do that? So mm -hmm. I kind of, I did like nine. That's um, smart. Uh, and yeah, so I've just, right now I've just kind of thrown it out into the ether. It's called the Make Art Manifesto. Um, but yeah, I'll just keep, I'm going to keep annoying you about, uh, I think th this is my version of, of going on set for Adam and Eve. I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. But it's kind of fun. Like, yeah. it's nice to not, not know what the fuck you're doing sometimes. I didn't know what sometimes. I was doing either. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. Yeah. That's how you, that's how you learn. And of course, if you guys want to follow me on social media, I'm at Holly on Instagram and on Twitter. Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filter to support this podcast and get access to special live streams. I do live stream all of my podcast interviews, but not publicly like this one was. So if you want to watch the, my other interviews live, um, you do have to join my Patreon for that. Make sure that you guys go and buy this special edition memoir. Go to kickstarter.com and just Google Suze Randall or click the link in the episode Yeah, it's all about me. Yeah. 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 Also, the links are in all of our Instagrams and yeah. uh, I mean, Twitters and all or X's it's or whatever literally the fuck it is like now. Everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. You've got to pay for my horses. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> get a pay and confidentially, pay. we're at double so far. So we're doing fucking great. Yes. You, but that everybody. doesn't mean that you should not contribute. No, the better. No, because he's yeah. stolen it all. Yes, it's all my money. None for you. <laughs> uh, no, but also I'm hoping that, like, I'm kind of excited if we, you know, I have, we, we've talked about a few, uh, like, new stretch goals and kind of new reward ideas. So every time we get a little further, a lot of what I do stretch goal-wise, and it is for my books, but I'm definitely doing it for Suze's book, we're not throwing a bunch of extra enamel pins and mugs and bullshit at you. Mm. We are making... Just condoms. Just condoms. Oh, my <laughs> God, a Suze condom, a Suze branded <laughs> condom, with a little hole poked in it because breeding. Um... <laughs> But we're just we're making the books better. So every time we hit a stretch goal, the the pay the the pages get nicer. We're gonna do foil stamping, spot UV. I'm really hoping. I think it'll it's probably gonna be a hundred thousand dollar stretch goal. But I'm talking to the printer about. You ever? It's called a. Uh, I think it's called like a soft touch lamb. But it's if you ever picked up a book and it just feels like it's super soft and it's actually kind of a romantic like, experience like to read it. Like your penis. Like my penis. <laughs> <laughs> if you it, it want a just, book, it's as soft and it opens. Soft um, <laughs> and open is Alan's penis. Help us get Help to us our get stretch to goal grand. of a hundred k. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a it's a thing that makes the book actually feel really nice and yeah. soft. And I love the idea of having an actual sensual experience picking up your your photography book. Yeah. And then you open it and you have an even a more sensual experience. Yeah. yeah. And also I I meant to share the story and before so before we close I'm going to god damn it because oh, I practiced it, it in the car. Never gonna stop I'm never going to stop. I always talk. Oh. Um 
I was going to apologize for being a little bit sleepy today because oh, I was on Suze.net until 10 p.m. pulling Tara Patrick pictures down for a Tara Patrick clamshell reward. And Tara Patrick does not have a soothing effect uh, when you want to go to sleep. I she would wants to get you erect. All I, the time. I imagine so, especially your photos of her. So, yeah, uh, uh, don't look at Suze.net. Uh, it's, it's like a, what is it? Like a. Unless you finish the job. Yeah. The yeah, problem was yeah. is that you didn't follow through. It could be that too. Yeah. Then you would have slept like a baby. But, yeah. but it's like one of the, the ending of G.I. Joe when they do the little uh, PSA. The PSA is get off Suze.net by 8 p.m. at the absolute latest or you will not sleep till 3 a.m. Okay. <laughs> Let's throw him out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, love you all. And happy holidays also. Oh, it's Christmas. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.